Stay with BBS 39 as we focus on history. From the Battle of the Bulge to VE Day and the Nuremberg Trials, we share the first-hand accounts from veterans who served in World War II and now serve as witnesses to history on this episode of Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, banking, insurance, investments, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Focus, recorded in the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39. I'm Grover Silcox. In this episode, we dig into the archives to focus on history and remember those who served in World War II, often under brutal conditions. In 2013, Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo had the honor of speaking with four veterans who survived one of the bloodiest battles American soldiers ever fought. Since that time, each of these veterans has passed away, but their stories they shared live on. On December 16, 1944, German armies initiated what is known as one of the bloodiest battles of World War II, the Battle of the Bulge. It was a surprise offensive on American soldiers in the densely wooded area of the Arden Forest. The battle cost the lives of 19,000 American soldiers and about 20,000 German troops. But this last-ditch effort sealed the fate of Hitler and his Nazi regime. One soldier fighting for freedom over tyranny was Allentown native Ray Brong. This was Hitler's last big push. He threw everything he had in there and he lost. And it was good he did. Ray was drafted the day after his 20th birthday and became part of the 84th Infantry Division of the 909th Field Artillery Battalion. Airplanes were going over into Germany and airplanes were coming back. It was like a two-lane highway. They were going in and bombing. Kept sending planes, and, and the ones that were done were coming back. I'll never forget that. Amidst the buzz bombs and shellings, Ray endured the brutal sub-freezing temperatures and snow-covered forests during the bulge. It was very cold, and we had snow. During that time, the battle was on. And uh, I did sleep a few nights in a sleeping bag, and uh, I slept a couple times in a foxhole. While Ray and countless others risked their lives to end the Second World War, Evangeline Coyman of Allentown fought to save them. The French Legion of Honor, I won it. All the patients that we had were within an hour after they had been injured, and we took care of them. We gave them an intravenous, and the corpsmen did all the administration of the penicillin. Penicillin became very popular in World War II. Shortly after graduating from St. Luke's Hospital School of Nursing in 1943, Evangeline enlisted in the Army and became part of the 59th Field Hospital in the 90th Division. We saw head injuries, chest injuries, abdominal injuries, arms, legs back. We just saw just about everything. When they shot, they didn't care what they were, which part of the body they were doing it, they just shot. Only a few miles from battle, Lieutenant Coyman and other trained medical personnel worked around the clock to care for the wounded. We had 12 hour duty and we had it seven days a week. We knew we had a habit and no saying, well, I need my day off. No. Robert Smith from Northampton, a trailblazer of the 70th Infantry Division, was held as a prisoner of war at the time of the bulge, along with more than 300 other American soldiers in his camp. The camp didn't have any war to run into it. So they put us to work and dig in a trench to, to put a war line in, so they had a war, line, war up in the camp. All well, we got out of the was a, a bowl of thin soup every day and a small piece of bread. That was it. I saw the results. The dead soldiers. It took Sergeant Gerald Jake Kohler from Bethlehem 40 years to open up about the horrors he witnessed in World War II. Everything is blown up by our bombings. 
about every 20, 30 feet, there was a bouquet of flowers, so you knew there was a body in there. Why all those people had to be killed to get Hitler. The valor of vets such as Ray, Evangeline, Robert, Jake, and thousands of others kept the world safe for democracy and led to one of the nation's greatest periods of growth and prosperity. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzilla reporting. The world breathed a collective sigh of relief on VE Day when the Nazi war machine was finally vanquished. Nathan Klein remembers the joy of that day. He also remembers all the tough fighting it took to achieve it. Nathan had a passion for serving back in 1942 and even today. Here's more on this remarkable man. On May 8, 1945, the United States and its allies celebrated VE Day, the triumphant end of the war with Nazi Germany. Hitler wanted to be a world conqueror, and, and, and he had to be stopped. And for a time, we were losing that war rather badly. Now it was reversed, and now the Nazi menace is, is expunged, and there's this great sense of release. Winston Churchill called VE Day the greatest eruption of joy in the history of mankind. People were delirious. I mean, reported two million people celebrating in Times Square, set all kinds of records. It was a big deal, a big deal. Nathan Klein, a retired U.S. Air Force major, remembers celebrating VE Day in his native Allentown after he had served on a B-26 bomber over Europe. I was just home a couple days and uh, the town went crazy. The world rejoiced after some of the most intense fighting in the months leading up to Germany's surrender. Most Americans are dying in the last nine months of the war. D-Day, June, 44, it's less than a year, and there's a lot of fighting in those 11 months. Nathan served as a bombardier navigator on a B-26 Marauder bomber in the 9th Air Force. He was only 19 years old when his group flew over Normandy, supporting the D-Day invasion. Crouched inside the plexiglass nose of the plane, he saw the massive battle unfold below him. There was 8,000 ships. Well, I could see most of the whole thing. We had the American Expeditionary Force Radio, and they opened the program with a Star Spangled Banner. So here I am crossing the channel, the sun's coming up, national anthem, all these boats. It was just brought tears. <laughs> His job was to set the navigation and drop bombs on specific targets, such as bridges, enemy troops, and railroads. When he had a chance, he'd snap a photo with his Brownie box camera. He caught this photo in flight from his plane on D-Day. This is a Brownie box camera, and you take pictures from this way or this way by turning the camera. The Germans rained down hellfire on Allied troops who were in the water and on the beaches, but they were also pounding the air with flak, exploding steel. We went up to 12,000 feet, and that's when the heavy stuff came up. So this piece of flak, as I say, was about four inches, uh, came through between my legs. It just missed him. He had other close calls, including two crash landings at the Battle of the Bulge. One earned him a distinguished flying cross. His plane took a hit from enemy fire. The turret gunner was wounded, and Nathan hustled to save him. The wound was so large in his groin, I couldn't use a tourniquet, so I took gauze and loaded it with uh, uh, sulfonilamide and forced it in there, and it froze at 12,000 feet. But uh, when we got below freezing on our way down, uh, he literally bled to death. Meanwhile, the plane's landing gear wouldn't work. And we landed in snow, and <laughs> the snow's coming up over the plexiglass. I couldn't see anything, and I had my fingers crossed. Like most vets who served in war, Nathan doesn't consider himself a hero. I always say, don't portray me as a hero. The heroes are the guys who died. Nathan had served with another crew that wasn't so lucky. They were killed when their plane got shot down. 
a Pathé News cameraman caught it on film from another plane. I was quite upset. My first thought is, I should have been there. Nate will never forget. His apartment serves as a museum of sorts with artifacts from his military service. After the war, he was given a commission and served in the Air Force Reserve. He retired in 1984 as a major. In 2009, the French government awarded him the Legion of Honor for his wartime service. He worked with the FBI for six years, ran a family business, and still serves on 14 boards. He also helps veterans in his role as Allentown's liaison to the military. And when he's not serving others, if I get a day off, I go nuts. I don't want to do it myself. Nathan Klein, a man who has navigated through the toughest and the best of times with service as his guide. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. More than 70 years ago, the Nuremberg trials convicted top Nazi leaders for the murder of an estimated 11 million people in Nazi death camps and millions more in their war of aggression. One Montgomery County man bore witness to history as an interpreter at the Nuremberg Trials, as a German from a Jewish family who escaped the Holocaust, and as a soldier with a U.S. Infantry Division who helped liberate a Nazi death camp. The Allied powers rejoiced when Nazi Germany surrendered in May of 1945. That ended the war. But the question of accountability remained. Who would be responsible for the Nazi atrocities committed during the war? That question was answered several months later at the historic Nuremberg war crimes trials in Nuremberg, Germany. In a packed courtroom in Nuremberg, the first session of the true trial of the century was opened. 92-year-old Dr. George Sackheim a retired psychologist speaks often about his role as an interpreter at the historic Nuremberg trials, which began on November 20th, 1945. During the ensuing nine or 10 months, 23 former Reich government ministers and high officials stood trial. They were tried before a panel of judges from the United States, Great Britain, France, and Russia two from each country. George, who was born in Germany to reform Jewish parents, came to America in 1938 and was fluent in German and English. He had served as an intelligence specialist with the U.S. Infantry through the war in Europe. Now at 22 years old, he was about to come face to face with some of the men who started the war he just finished fighting. I was the interpreter for Hermann Goering on one occasion, April 6, 1945. Goering, once second in command to Adolf Hitler, created the much feared Gestapo secret police and commanded the German Air Force. George had kept a diary of his interrogation sessions and shares a passage in which he quotes Goering. This is my direct translation, and I quote, I told him, Hitler, time and time again, that we must destroy the English war industry instead of wasting our bombs by dropping them on that stupid London. What good will it do us if a few hundred more houses would go up in flames, says Goering to Hitler. And Hitler didn't agree with that. He said he wanted him to continue bombing London. George acquired photos of the Nuremberg courtroom from a Russian photographer on a newspaper assignment. A couple of the photos show Goering's disdain for the whole proceedings. Goering said he had no remorse, not an iota of remorse for anything he did or he ordered others to do. When he was first captured, he said to the general who met him, Oh, war is like a football game. The loser shakes hands with the winner, and then all is forgiven. In the early 1930s, George and his mother fled from Germany to Palestine before the Nazis took over completely. She listened to some of Hitler's speeches, and they were devastating. I mean, everything, all of Germany's misfortunes were due to the Jews. 
Well, my mother was an intelligent lady, and she said that man means business, and he's not going to stop until his program is, is realized. She said, we're not staying here. Six years after arriving in Palestine, George's mother learned she had cancer and sent George to live with relatives in the U.S. She probably knew we weren't going to see each other again. I think it was very courageous of her to do that when you're so sick. George assimilated quickly in America. In 1942, he began studies at Columbia University, but soon after was drafted into the Army. He trained as an intelligence specialist and served with the 104th Infantry Division as U.S. forces swept the Germans from the Normandy beaches to Berlin. In Germany, his unit liberated the Nazi death camp at Nordhausen. There, George saw the unspeakable. Some survived but some of them just wanted to see the liberation and then they died. They were exhausted. They looked like they weighed 60 or 70 pounds. If George had wondered what kind of people could do this, he'd get his answer at the Nuremberg trials as an interpreter for Rudolf Haas, the ruthless commandant of the death camp at Auschwitz in Poland. He uh, confessed that during his tour of duty as commandant, uh, the first time he said three million Jews were killed, exterminated. But then when we brought up these papers the next time for him to sign, he said, no, 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 I didn't say three million, I said two and a half million. The other half a million died from disease, starvation, and epidemics, and uh, illnesses. George also served as a courtroom monitor, seated just below the top tier of judges. The monitor's job was to clarify a given interpretation during the proceedings. If one of the defense lawyers felt that what his client said was not interpreted correctly, Chief Justice Lawrence, he'd call a halt to the proceedings until everybody was satisfied that the translation was accurate. George left the trials on May 1st, 1946, to finish college. Five months later, the tribunal handed down its verdict. There were 12 defendants had been sentenced to death, but 11 were actually executed, and the others got long prison sentences. Only one defendant scheduled for execution cheated the hangman, and that was Hermann Goering. A couple of hours before his execution, he took a cyanide pill and killed himself. But the truth prevailed, and so did George Sackheim. He earned a PhD and enjoyed a long career as a psychologist. He and his wife of 66 years, Ilsa, who escaped Nazi death camps in Poland, were recently invited to attend the 70th anniversary memoriam in Nuremberg, Germany, by Dr. John Barrett, an expert on the Nuremberg trials. George believes the Nuremberg trials are as important today as they were 70 years ago. I had a tremendous feeling of triumph that good won out over evil, that these men were all brought to account. And that the impact of these trials continues for generations to come. And, uh, for Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. We end our program with the story of a World War II veteran who uses his special talent to pay homage to those who served and died. We met Dan Deicher in 2014 as he prepared a special Memorial Day tribute. Ninety-two-year-old vet Dan Deicher plays the U.S. Navy hymn Eternal Father for one of his own, a fellow Navy man whose battles are over. He concludes with taps. The haunting sound signifies both the mourning and respect of a grateful nation. I have never done it for accolades or pats on the back. 
every single time I do it, I, I feel it in my heart. Since retiring from Bethlehem Steel in 1985, he's played taps at more than 3,200 funeral services for sailors, soldiers, and Marines. I do it with reverence. I do it with feeling. As much as I can do it for every single one of those military veterans. Dan played trumpet in Bethlehem's Liberty High School band till he graduated in 1939. He applied to the U.S. Navy School of Music and was accepted in 1942, just after America entered World War II. He was supposed to study at the school for two years out of a six year enlistment. The war changed all that, so I was at the school about 10 months and then I was assigned with a 21 piece unit to the USS Pennsylvania, which was part of the 7th Fleet out in the Pacific Ocean. From there, it got a little hectic. <laughs> During the war, U.S. battleships and carriers carried 21-piece bands to entertain and boost morale, unless they were in battle. And then we were assigned to regular duty as stretcher bearers or, or five-inch gun watches. The Pennsylvania participated in every amphibious combat operation in the South Pacific and earned eight battle stars. Between battles, Dan and his fellow musicians entertained the troops. We were able to play either classical or dance music. The musicians were very versatile. One time, the band was rehearsing for a show when a young Lieutenant J.G. asked if he could MC. And we said, oh, sure, why not? Well, that L Lieutenant J.G. turned out to be Johnny Carson. After the war, Dan finished his enlistment in Norfolk, Virginia. It's the best band that I ever played with, and it's the Norfolk Naval Base Band in 1946. Dan finished his Navy hitch, graduated from her sinus college, and went back to Bethlehem Steel, where he worked with computers until his retirement. He and his wife Abigail, an RN, had two children, Dan and Donna. He taught both kids to play trumpet and his grandchildren. This is my grandson, Chris. He lives in Fairfax, Virginia, works for Lockheed Martin. This, of course, is me. And this is my son, Daniel. He lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and works for Bass Pro. And they all, and you all play trumpet. And we all play trumpet. Since Abigail died in 1994, Dan's kept busy performing for Legion posts, veterans' funerals, and military ceremonies, including the 65th and 70th anniversaries of the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. There, he teamed up with a Liberty High School marching band. The band played Eternal Father, which is the Navy hymn, and they backed me up with taps. For Memorial Day 2014, Dan's hoping to get 50 trumpet players and buglers to join him in playing echo taps from Niski Hill Cemetery to Memorial Park in Bethlehem to remember those who fought and served. Some of Liberty High's trumpeters have already signed up. The version that we're performing for this Memorial Day um, basically is a pass-off version where one player starts and the next player picks up on the heels of the other. For Dan, Echo Taps is for all the vets, including those who were buried without the honor of having taps played. I think it would be a nice experience, and I think every single bugler that's there is going to say, this is for you, veteran, that you didn't get your, your ultimate rent recognition. As long as Dan's around, every vet will be remembered and recognized on Memorial Day and every day. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you for joining us for this special focus on history. This program is recorded at the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39 in Bethlehem.